Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. The Word of God is very clear. When we act in faith, when we obey the purposes, the will of God, we will frequently find ourselves being persecuted. Those who belong to the world, they will rise up against us. And in those times that are difficult, we need to remember that the Word of God says, count such experiences for joy. And we can have assurance that God, because of our obedience and faithfulness, because we are in the midst of His will, He will act, He will move, He will be our deliverer. And therefore, with confidence, it's easier to turn to Him because we are where we ought to be. But today, I want to speak about a very different situation. And that is when we are in the midst of suffering, there are those who are rising up against us. We are in a very hard predicament because, well, we've made it ourselves. We haven't been faithful. We haven't been obedient. We have behaved incorrectly. We have sinned. We have been a spiritual failure. And now as a consequence of that, because we do believe in God, we do have a covenant with Him. Nevertheless, we are outside His will and the enemy is attacking. They are exploiting our faithlessness and our rebellion in order to destroy us. Then what should we do? Well, even at those times, it may seem difficult, but even at those times, the wisest thing that you can do is nevertheless turn to God, to seek His assistance, to pray to Him and to affirm this covenantal relationship you have with Him. Well, with that said, to get your Bible, and look with me to the book of Psalms and Psalm number three. Now, to me, Psalm three is an extraordinary psalm because notice how it begins. And by the way, we are in our study of the book of Psalms and you need to learn a term, the inscription. And not all Psalms have inscriptions. But this one does, where it says in Psalm 3, Mizmor le David, which means a Psalm of David. And then it tells us a little bit about what was going on in David's life when he wrote it. We read, when he fled from before Absalom. Now, in English, that's Absalom. But I want to say it in the Hebrew way, Av Shalom, his son. Now, my hope is that you remember a little bit about this account in the scripture. First of all, David, we need to remember, although the scripture says that he is a man after God's own heart, David was someone who would humble himself, he would repent, he would seek the purpose of God, and for the most part, David, of course, was a great man. But nevertheless, there were times in his life, and one of which is with a woman named Bathsheba. He committed adultery with her. And you recall that a man by the name of Nathan, or Nathan, he spoke to David. And Nathan said, the sword, 
because of that sin, the sword will not depart from your household. That means that sin that David committed, it was going to have implications. And those implications would be difficult, not just for David, but for his entire household. And it wouldn't just come and end and be done, but it was going to continue. That sword will not depart from your household. And we see that a man, a son of David, nevertheless unknown, he committed a most sinful act with his half-sister, a young woman by the name of Tamar. And Tamar's brother, full brother, was Absalom, whom the inscription spoke to. And we see that in the end, because of David's failure to handle this properly, but remember something, David, he was more or less guilty of a similar sin. That sin with Bathsheba. And therefore it was hard for him to judge one who had done something that he had done. And David, in a very, very sad way, simply wanted to kind of just sweep this under the rug. Be done with it. But for Absalom, he was grieved for his sister Tamar. And in the end, Avshalom rose up and he put Amnon to death. Remember that prophecy from the Tan. The sword, meaning death, will not depart from your household. And so after David had done nothing and Avshalom had put, put Amnon to death, there was a, a breaking in their relationship between father and son. Absalom fed, fled for a while, but in the end he returned, but he did not see his father's face. One day Absalom couldn't take it anymore, and he demanded to see his father's face, and his father was very uh, casual, like it wasn't important to him that for those several years, most scholars believe around five. It simply wasn't important to David that he did not see Absalom. And Absalom was hurt by that, and many believe it was this hurt that caused Absalom to rebel against David and to assemble those that threw David outside of Jerusalem, caused him as the first verse of Psalm 3 said, caused David to flee from before Absalom. Now, David, he was no longer at least functioning as king. He was on the run for his life. And his enemy was his own son. He had lost the throne. He was humiliated by his son. Many people had turned against him. And you can imagine David understanding, remembering that prophecy from Natan, the sword will never depart from your household. So what did David do? Well, perhaps many would simply give up. God, I have failed you, and that's what I am, a failure. And maybe just simply run to some other place. Some weaker ones would maybe even commit suicide. Others would just be so ashamed that they would disappear and, and wouldn't serve God and would feel uncomfortable to pray to God and expect God to respond at all. See, David was indeed in this difficult circumstance. And for the most part, it was one that he had made for himself. So look again at this first verse, and it is the first verse of the text. We read, A psalm of David, when he fled from before Absalom, his son. In the next verse, in the Hebrew text, verse 2, notice what it says. 
David did something. We read here that David turned to God. Learn a principle. It is never too late. It is never incorrect to turn to God. It doesn't matter what predicament that you're in, what you're going through, who the enemy is, and why, why you're suffering, why you have failed. Always, always, always. It is right. God is forever listening, at least as long as we're alive. He is forever listening for us to turn to him. And that's exactly what David did. He turned to the Lord, and notice what he says. Look now to the next verse where he says, O Lord, ma rabu sarai. How they have increased, and who's the they? My enemies. What David is saying is this. All around him, and this will become clearly stated in a few minutes. But the increase of his enemies has has greatly increased. But nevertheless, he turns to the Lord. And I think it's significant that it speaks of not simply God or Adonai, but the term yud heh vav speaking about the God who transcends all things, meaning the God where Everything is possible. So he says, O Lord, how they have increased my enemies. Many have have raised up against me. In a very real way. Yes, David has some soldiers with him, some servants who have remained loyal, but so many influential people have have given up on David. They believe that David has fled and that is his end. And it could have been his end. He could have given up. He could have wallowed in self-pity. He could have focused upon his sin and his disobedience and his rebelliousness, but he didn't. He turned to God in faith and he shared with God what his situation was, how his enemies have increased, and how there were many that had raised up against him. Look now to verse 3. Rabim omrim le nafshi. Many are saying. Now, this describes the people. They are constantly speaking. That's what the text And the grammatical construction teaches us. Many, and we see the word many repeated unto now. Three times. The first in a verbal construction, the other two in in nouns. Many say to, notice, le nafshi. Nafshi is my soul. Now, what some of the scholars teach about this is that they are speaking to David spiritually. Not in a physical way, not in a secular way, not just looking at this situation with the eyes of man, but they are attacking David and saying things spiritually against him. David, you are that spiritual failure. You are a sinner. You are are not really a man of God. You have failed your family. You did not stand up for righteousness. And the list can go on and on. He says, many say to my soul. And notice what the key thing that is emphatically said here in the text. And Yeshua ta lo. There is no salvation for him in God. Selah. Now, there's much debate about what the term Selah means. It is recorded here three times. Many different interpretations of it. But I want to focus in on what we do know. And notice what many were saying 
and sometimes the many means the vast majority. They were saying to David, there is no salvation, meaning victory. There is no deliverance for you. You have failed, you have blown it, and therefore you, for as long as you are alive, you are going to live in defeat. Now, that's what the enemy says. And that's what David's enemies were saying, probably inspired by, by satanic propaganda. But realize, our God is a God of restoration. With God, all things are possible. One of the things that true biblical faith speaks to us is this. Never, ever give up. No matter what situation you are in, how bad you have created a mess of your life, realize with God there can be restoration. Why? With Him all things are possible. And God loves. It is His nature. His word confirms this. God is a God of deliverance and a God of restoration. If we humbly approach him with a contrite heart, God, he will not reject us, but rather he will receive us. And he will bring us back into a covenantal hope. And that's what David is believing. That's why David has turned to God in prayer. So those who say there is no salvation for him in God, say la. Well, they are wrong. Most people would believe that, but David didn't. Verse 4, David affirms, he speaks, and you, O Lord, are a shield for me. Now, this is the word magen, and it's simply a shield or a defense. And God If we approach him and seek his deliverance, his defense against the enemies, God will always, always be faithful. When we repent God, he does not send us away, but he will meet us in the mess of our life. And he will walk with us and we will walk in his will. And he will begin to put things little by little He will begin to put things back in order, his order. With God, all things are possible. So he says, David speaks to the Lord and says, You, O Lord, are a shield for me. Kibodi umarim roshi. And he says, my honor. Now, what this verse speaks, and it's very important that we understand it, it's the word kavod. Kavod is honor or glory. And what David is saying is this. The greatest honor, the glory of my life is God. Being in this covenantal relationship, knowing that no matter what I have done, he will not leave me nor forsake me. God is as always as close as the repentant heart is. And David is announcing, he's writing this down, and here's the key. He's not saying this after he's been restored, after years, and he puts back his life and such. No, he wrote this, remember what it says, when he fled. And that means in the midst of it, at the beginning of it, David, he turned back to God. And he says clearly in this scripture, You, O Lord, not only are you a shield for me, but you are my glory and umerim roshi. Now, that phrase means, and the lifter of my head. Now, there's two things that we need to discern from that expression. Chazal, that is a Hebrew expression meaning the sages of blessed memory. They teach the phrase marim roshi means, first, God is going to encourage me. Isn't that great? No matter where I am, if I turn 
in repentance with a contrite heart, God is going to do something. He is going to impart, instill within me encouragement. Encouragement that he's going to be with me. That he's inviting me to walk in his will. That he is going to take me back to where he wants me to be. So it's this encouragement, but also the second thing is an acknowledgement. God, he doesn't say to us, you're not my son. You're not my daughter anymore. You born, that's it. I have, have, have washed my hands of any relationship, any commitment with you. No, if we turn to God repentantly with a broken, contrite heart, looking to him to be restored to him and his will, God will, hear this, always, always acknowledge us. See, being reprobate, because I know where some of you are coming from and what you're going to think, David's not retrobate. Reprobate is one that, hear that carefully, one that is reprobate, which is a theological term, which his heart has been seared, and one who is reprobate doesn't turn back to God, wouldn't think, wouldn't be interested in, in repentance. A reprobate individual is one that says, I'm done with God. It's not that God has ended it, but they have ended it with God. David is not such a person. Verse 5, Koli el Hashem ekra, which means my voice to the Lord ekra, which means I will call. I don't know why, but, but several English translations puts it in the past or in the present, but it's in the future. Now, why? I will call. Why doesn't he do it now? Obviously, he is and he has. But here's the key. The use of the future. Some would call it the imperfect. That's fine. Same grammatical construction, just two different names. But the word is ekra, which means I will call. And what it speaks of is a commitment. It's the future tense to show a future and an ongoing and a continuous commitment that David has. David is not just going to say, God, I'm going to give you one more chance. I'm going to call out, are you going to solve this or not? David is saying, I have nowhere else to turn. And I'm going to call and call and continue and consistently call unto you. Because David is not forsaking this covenant. David is responding because his acknowledgement of a covenant, a covenant relationship which has power attached to it. So he says, my voice to the Lord I will call. And he, and this is in the past because of the vav uh, consecutive, but let me just simply say, and he has answered me. Now, it's odd because if David will call, then why does it say he will answer? But the construction, it's in the imperfect, the future, but the vav in front of it switches it to the perfect or the past. And it's simply a statement of assurance. David knows. I'm going to say it again. David has full assurance. He knows that God is going to respond. David knows that our sins, our rebelliousness, even though they bring disappointment, they bring the enemy, it's like an invitation to them to ruin our life, to rise up against us, to go to war against us. But nevertheless, David knows something. He knows that one who humbles himself and will call upon God, God, it says, you have answered me. Literally, he has answered me from his holy mountain 
And here's the second time, that Hebrew word, Selah. And not only, not only is David praying to God, but the reference, once again, Chazal, the sages of blessed memory, Chazal sees Har Kodshi as a, a reference to worship. So David is not just beseeching God, praying God, God help me, won't you please, and such. But in the midst of prayer, that prayer turns into a worship experience. So here's a very important principle. When we have failed God, when we are in the midst of sin and disobedience and rebelliousness, maybe, maybe there's been no consequences as of yet. No implications. I, I've sinned, but, but everything's the same. And it comes into your mind, well, I should, should pick up this book. I should maybe read it. I should pray. I should, should go and worship God, return back to that assembly, my local congregation. And what happens? I know what happens. Satan says, what? You who have sinned in this way again, you who have failed God, rebelled, you who have acted in the flesh, God doesn't want to hear you. God doesn't want worship from people like that. What, what are you thinking? See, that's what the enemy says. David didn't acknowledge that. David says, God, you have answered me in the midst of worship from your holy mountain. Again, he will answer me from his holy mountain, Selah. Verse Verse 6, David, understand the context. He has fled Jerusalem, and, and Absalom's armies, those who were David's armies, who were loyal to David, no more. The vast majority of those soldiers are now in, in allegiance with Absalom. And David goes out, he's on the run, and he doesn't know. Are they going to find me? Am I going to wake up to see the enemy over me with their sword, with their spear, ready to stab me? Or they won't even wake me up. They're just going to kill me on the spot. But what does David say here? David sleeps, and he sleeps confidently. Why? Look, if you would, to, to verse, verse 6. I have laid down, nighttime, I have laid down, and I have slept. I have come to the end of sleep. The sleep comes to an end. Why? How did he lay down and sleep and rise up the next day? Ki Hashem Yismecheni, which means, and and the Lord, he has sustained me. Now, this is a word which shows reliance upon. And when we rely upon God, he is reliable. It's a word for trusting as well. So David says, because I've lied down in faith, I've come to the end and God has he has sustained me. Verse 7. I will not fear. David is speaking. I will not fear from ten thousands of people. So even though David is, is greatly outnumbered, he says, Lo ira me revivot am. From ten thousands people, I will not fear. Who asher seviv shatu elai. Shatu is they place themselves against me and all around. Now, literally, this word all is not there. It simply says who around, but the implication is all around. They have placed, placed themselves around me. David knows he is in a very 
difficult situation. The enemy is abundant, numerous, and they are around him. But David is not going to base his thoughts, his worship, his repentance upon what he sees with his eyes. Because we repent because we believe, and hear this, we believe in God's faithfulness to his promises that he has made to his people. And learn another important spiritual truth. As a sinner, I'm a sinner and you're a sinner. We have all have failed God. We all have disobeyed. We all have, have rebelled. Now, what does that mean? Well, there may be various degrees, but in actuality, we all have failed. But we don't have to continue in failure. We don't have to continue in defeat. We don't have to receive defeat. With God, circumstances can be transformed. And God, His nature, He delights in restoring things for His people. God is, as we sang each time in the synagogue, Huha Ozer. He's my helper. So we read in verse 8, David says, confidently, assuredly, Kuma Adonai, Hoshiani Elohai, which means, rise up, O Lord, and save me, my God. Now, I would underscore that expression, my God. Why? Because here's what the enemy's going to tell you, and how can it be so sure? Because I failed. I've rebelled. I've been in a situation that I felt God would never want to hear me. I've blown it. I have, have acted in a way that shows that I have forsaken the things of God. But you know what? God is listening. In fact, God is the one that's put it upon a person's heart to turn back to Him, to pray, to worship Him, to turn and read in His Word, and to begin to serve God. So David says with confidence, and he wants to impart such confidence in you and in me. So he says, believing, and he's right, Rise up, O Lord, and save me, and here's the key, my God. Others might say, oh, he's not your God anymore. He doesn't want to have anything to do with you. How dare you call him your God? Well, David did. And David, he was guilty of adultery. He was guilty of murder. Remember, he had constructed a way in order that Uriah the Hittite would be put to death in a battle. And he said, pull back, retreat, and make sure Uriah is at the front of the battle. And in doing so, remember, Yoab said, I mean, many of the servants of David will perish if I do this. David says, so what? Do it anyway. David's actions, his sin of adultery, his attempts to cover it up, he killed many people, his actions. But nevertheless, he repented. He is an example for us. And he says, my God, and here's the good news, God did not reject him. You say an adulterer and a murderer, he would not reject. That is right. And I say this because perhaps right now there's someone who is guilty of such things. Maybe they are sitting in prison. Maybe they've never been convicted of their crime. And they're sitting there and they're feeling God would never hear my prayer. Yes, he will. And God will respond and he will move to bring about restoration in your life, not avoiding the consequences of sin, but causing you to triumph over them, to be brought through them. And this is exactly what God's going to do with David. So he says, Kuma Adonai, rise up, 
O Lord. Hoshe'eni Elohai, save me, my God. For, and here's confidence for you, for you have struck all of my enemies on the cheek. Now, what is that? That expression, to strike someone on the cheek, it's speaking about shame. And what David is saying is this, God, shame those who want to shame one who is in a covenantal relationship with you. David, he is seeking forgiveness. He is seeking mercy. He is seeking God's grace. But realize, God's grace brings us back to a position whereby we can take hold of, we can have hope in the promises of God. So David speaks boldly, and he says, look at the end of, of verse 8, Shine reshaim, the teeth of the wicked ones you have broken. This is another way of speaking about how God will move, not only to shame and defeat, but to humiliate those who come against his covenantal people. See, when I hear, when I hear a psalm like this, I think about Israel. I am so glad that God has not replaced Israel because that tells me that he is not going to say to a Gentile who has entered into a new covenant, you know what? You're going to lose your salvation. You're, I'm, I'm going to just forsake you. I'm going to deny you because you haven't lived up to what I think you should, my standards. God, what does he say? Messiah says this, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Behold, or lo, I am with you always. Isn't that great? I mean, many times we continue in rebelliousness, in failure, in disobedience, even though we know where God's will is, we don't turn to it because we forget something. We forget that God says, listen, and this is Messiah, I will not leave you. Lo, I am with you always until the end of the age. Now, this word, this word for leave, there's two words. I heard someone teaching not too long ago on this, and they combined, they combined two Hebrew words into one concept, and it's not. We have the word lazov to leave. And the word leapot, this is to let go. Oftentimes it's to forsake, but it's just to let go. And what God is saying here is two things. I'm not going to leave you, and I'm not going to let go of you. God is going to maintain that relationship. And you know what that tells me? It tells me that I can have hope. And the fact that God says, I'm not going to let go of you, that is so humbling. And, and, and it spurs me to return to obedience, forgetting, as Paul says, those things that are behind and pressing on that upward call, that upward call that God has placed upon our heart. Well, let's conclude. Look at our last verse, verse 9. Ladonai HaYeshua. To the Lord is salvation. Or salvation belongs to the Lord. It, it's not mine. It's not something that I can lose. It's not something that I can cast away because it belongs to the Lord. And he is not going to leave me. He's not going to let go of me. And therefore, that salvation that belongs to him, because he is salvation, and I am with him eternally, he will never depart from me, I'm going to experience salvation. It has nothing to do with what I've done, but in what covenant I'm in. And if I'm in that new covenant that is established by the blood of his only begotten son, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, that I can be assured. He says in verse 9, Ladonai HaYeshua, to the Lord is, and notice this, it's not Yeshua 
but ha Yeshua. Why is that important? It is the salvation. And there's really just one. Finally, it says, upon your people, al amecha, birchatecha, and here's the third time, selah, upon your people. That's all it takes to be one of his people. And the only way, the only way, the only way to be part of his people is through a covenantal relationship. And that covenantal relationship is a new covenant. One where he will forgive our sins. He's already done the work so our sins can, all of them can be washed away and eternally forgiven to the point that he will not ever remember them anymore. And that's why it's so wise for us. And if you have any doubt where you are spiritually, settle that right now. Enter into that new covenant simply by saying, God, yes, I have failed you. I have rebelled. I've disobeyed. I've turned out of your will, and I'm a sinner. But I now am repenting, simply meaning I am turning to you, and I want to be delivered from sin in my life and the consequences of sin eternally. And I believe in your death upon that cross, that you shed your blood to redeem, pay that price of, of sin guiltiness in order that I can be forgiven. And I invite you to be the Lord of my life. I enter into a covenant, a covenant whereby my heart's desire is to serve you, to walk with you, to obey you. Our salvation is not dependent upon our performance, but if we don't want to serve him, then we haven't entered into a covenant. We don't know him because a true person who has understand the gospel wants to serve God, wants to come under the Lord's authority. So he says this great term, to the Lord is the salvation. And upon your people is your blessing, Selah. Well, one of the reasons that we do these videos is to encourage people to do just that. To live in such a way, in a covenantal relationship with God, that you will be a recipient forever and ever and ever in His kingdom of His blessings. Let me promise you this. His blessings satisfy. His blessings in the kingdom are eternal. They never wear out. They never disappear, and they never become less satisfying. The blessings of God, they satisfy. They are an instrument of joy. And the great thing is, is that they're His blessings, and we will enjoy it with Him in His presence in that kingdom forever and ever and ever. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.